Okay, everyone, let's let's get going. Uh, welcome to our second day of, of live tutorials. Um, I know many of us were planning to be together in beautiful La Jolla, California, uh, which would have been would have been great. Um, but of course, we're all all dealing with a very comp complicated reality. So I'm glad you all were in the in the midst of it all able to join us uh, here here today for these live demos and We'll you know look forward to when we get to really talk about our our science uh, sometime about about a year from now. Um, so my hope for this uh, tutorial is that we'll walk through a a sort of full full workflow where we can get from uh, data as they come uh, come off uh, come off a magnetometer. Um, this, of course, the data formats that are generated off the magnetometer are different in in most most uh, labs. Um, but what we'll sort of illustrate is a is a workflow using DMAG GUI. This, of course, is not the only way to do it. Um, but the sort of perks of doing it using this suite of tools um, that that have been developed is that through the workflow, you can convert the data to magic format using these tools. You can then do your principal component analysis of in this case, we'll work through a data set of thermal demagnetization data. You can make your interpretations in an environment in which those interpretations are sort of inherently going to be saved and exported to magic format. Through doing so, a lot of the sort of maybe grunt work of adding specific method codes that are necessary for the database um, can be, uh, yeah, can, can be sort of integrated into the work that you're doing such that uh, there's sort of less, less of a hurdle on that last up upload to, to the database. I'll also show how we can take data that have been contributed to the database and how we can unpack them using the same PMAG GUI tool. Having unpacked them, we can then visualize the data as well as the interpretations at the measurement level. Now, I thought I'd just do a quick intro, like what is PMAG Pi? Because the landscape is, is slightly con confusing. Um, PMAG Pi is grown out of a project of, of Lisa Tokes, uh, who is a very early Python adapter um, and took a suite of Fortran codes that she, she developed, um, moved them into Python, and then developed a suite of command line programs. Those command line programs can still be, be used. Um, what the GUIs are is a way of uh, using the underlying code base in a way that we're trying to make quite user-friendly. GUI stands for Graphical User Interface. Um, and by the work of uh, Lori, who's done a lot of work on this, um, uh, this, this project, um, these are now available as these executable programs, which just means it's a normal sort of download and double click and open. Though, of course, there's a few more things to get around the security restrictions. The other thing, and I'll, I'll plug Lisa's uh, tutorial tomorrow, which is gonna show how all the underlying functions and many more uh, related with these programs uh, can be used in Python for paleomagnetic uh, data analysis, which allows much more flexibility than what is say exposed in these, in these programs alone. And Lisa's gonna be working through an example. What's cool about the example, and if you read through these instructions, is you'll be able to run through it on a remotely hosted server that will be running the code. So you don't need to mess with a local installation. Uh, instead, you'll be able to be running the code and using uh, PMAG, PMAG Pi sort of in the, uh, in, the, in the cloud. So I encourage you to come to Lisa's presentation tomorrow. So who's behind it? This is from the PMAG Pi uh, GitHub um, and shows the sort of Herculean efforts of Lori, who's up, up there, Lisa Tokes. Um, uh, Kevin Gastro, who's now a PhD student at uh, Berkeley, did a bunch of work um, building up DMAG GUI, sort of uh, building on an initial framework that Ron Shar had developed for the Tellier GUI uh, project. Um, and so he's, uh, he, as well as the others on here, have uh, made significant contributions. This is an open source 
project and there's room for lots of people to contribute uh, all the way from improving the documentation uh, to actually if there's some functionality you'd really like to see to see in it um, going ahead and uh, and contributing and that's the nice thing about the github framework where can you get more information there's a lot of information in the pmag pie cookbook that's available on the earth earthref.org um, and there is also information that you can find on the project on the project get github github page uh, what to cite if you use it uh, is is this is this paper um, that was published in 2016 that describes how describes the software and how it can be a bridge to the magic database a bridge that I'm hoping to illustrate through the demo today what to do if you have problems? Uh, the best way to communicate uh, if there are problems uh, is to go to GitHub, um, go to the issues and raise a new issue. Um, particularly if you find a bug, that'd be great. If you're having a problem using something, this is a good sort of discussion forum with which to get, um, with which you can get help. Um, it also can be a place for uh, feature requests, though remember uh, feature, feature requests uh, are are uh, very are more appreciated if they come with a associated uh, commitment to help help out. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go through and do do this live live demo. Um, as of course with live demos, there could be uh, could be hiccups, but hopefully this goes uh, relatively smoothly. Um, and again, you know there are, there are uh, you know sort of 20, 23 of us here, so. Uh, I totally want to make sure that people are um, getting help where they need it. So you can unmute yourself, ask ask a live question. Uh, if you have a question, you're probably not the only one. And if uh, the group chat is another place where if you have uh, sort of questions or if things I'm saying are unclear, uh, that you can raise them. And getting that sort of feedback is good. Also make sure that I don't think I'm just talking to myself if my connection drops here. So I'm going to exit out of these slides, and what I'm going to do, um, though I already double clicked on it, is you should go to where you've downloaded PMAG GUI, and you should double click it to open it up. It might take a little while to load. Um, we've it sort of depends on the version for which we've uh, compiled it, and on uh, Windows it seems to take a particularly long time. When it opens up, what you'll get is a, a window that will ask you to choose your working directory to create or edit a magic contribution. So here you should have downloaded and unzipped the 2020 DMAG GUI tutorial folder. So I'm going to go into that. I'm going to go into the data. And the first place we're going to be working is for a single paleomagnetic site. That site is SS. 20 and the data for that site as they came off the magnetometer in our lab is here. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose this to be my working directory and choose open. Interesting. John says he gets a box stating reading and data from current working directory. Please wait. And he cannot remove it. Are you on a, a PC or a Mac, John? Okay. Interesting. I don't know if anyone else is having that issue on, uh, on a PC. Um, well, why don't we just say you maybe you wait for a little bit, um, and it might uh, it might resolve itself. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so the first step we're going to do here is we are going to convert magnetometer files to magic format. In order to do our analysis and look at the plots the PMAG GUI is going to want our data to be in magic format, um, and it is uh, not. Um, so what I'm going to do here is go convert magnetometer files to magic format. 
So what I just did there was I clicked um, yeah, can click on that convert magic files uh, to, to magnetometer format. I'm actually going to open up here quick is going to be the DMAG GUI tutorial uh, window just so I can help illustrate some of this. Um, Okay, so here we click convert magnetometer files to, uh, to magic format. And here you'll see there, there are a number of lab formats uh, for which code has been written uh, to do this conversion. We are going to be using uh, the CIT format because that is what is generated in, uh, in, in our lab here. Um, but of course, if you have a different format, um, you can choose that one. There is a generic format that is possible as well um, at, at this step. Okay, so I'm gonna click now with that radio button selected, import file. And I'm gonna come in here. And this is where we can uh, point uh, the GUI to the correct file. So in this case, I'm going to choose the file. And if you're able to follow along with me, um, you can choose as well. And what we're going to do is choose this .sam file. Now, I don't expect you to go into the depths of how uh, this data structure works, but effectively, this .sam file lists all the samples in the site which have the underlying data. So that is the one that we want to select. Mm. Courtney has, uh, has put in to those who are maybe getting this hanging current working directory error. One thing that can be useful is there's this little dialogue. And if there is a real um, problem, um, it, it will actually tell you potentially an error. This is a good place to go if there's a problem. It also could be something where you could cut and paste from here into a GitHub issue. All right, so at this point, if you're able to be following along, we should have chosen the file and chose this ss20-sam file. Now here is where we can add a number of these different method codes. In this case, these are uh, samples that were measured from a basaltic lava from the mid big continent rift. Um, the field sampling was done with a drill. We determined the location site with a GPS. A Pomeroy orientation device was used. And unfortunately, it was a cloudy day. So we were using a magnetic compass. Okay, so this will then populate our method codes as we go forward with the subsequent steps. So here we need to tell um, the software how we're distinguishing, distinguishing between a sample, a site, and a specimen. If you were in Nick's uh, talk yesterday, you know that we'll be actually creating different magic tables for sample, for site sample specimen. In this case, we're using a dash to delineate between those two. Now, we, had, we distinguish between a sample and a specimen with one terminal character. That is, there is a site, the site is SS20, there'll then be dash sample one, and then there'll be an A that'll uh, show that the specimen is uh, is distinct from the sample. We need to now put in a location name. In this case, I'm going to say Michibikoden Island, but you could put whatever you wish in this case. Um, and then we have a choice here. We could average all replicates, say if there were the same step um, made multiple times. In this case, we want to import all replicates. Um, I think there's one remeasure in this in this data set uh, where we don't want to we don't want to measure. And then here are the number of measurement orientations. These were measured up and down and four orientations each, so they are indeed eight. So we can just leave it at that default. Okay, so now 
now that we've filled these out, I'm going to say OK. And I should get a message that says the files are converted to a magic format file. OK, and we'll come back to the same step one, step one window. And what we're going to click on here is go to next step. We've already imported the file. If I wanted to import more sites, I would keep looping through this step one to be importing more data. For this example, we're just going to import data from one step. Um, there's another message in the chat saying they don't see this WX Python box, and we might be running into the issue here that I'm much more familiar with the Mac uh, version of this than the, than the, than the PC one. Um, I will point out here, because it might be useful for some people who want to be sort of power users that all those boxes that I just clicked through um, are um, led to this command line program being executed. And this code we see here, if I actually wanted to replicate this, which could be useful if I want to do batch processing, I could actually copy and paste this at the command line and, uh, and run it. So it specified all the codes. OK, if that looks intimidating, don't worry. OK, what we're going to do here is we're going to go to the next step. OK, and here on, on the next step, we will, if we had multiple sites converted, this would uh, combine, uh, combine them together. Um, but right now, we just have one. So at this step two, we're just going to click OK. And it will tell us that it has merged this file to be a measurements.txt file, which is great. We already have one of our magic files. And now here, also, if we had multiple sites we wanted to combine together, we could be combining them into a single table as necessary for a magic contribution. Again, we're just doing one site here. So at this window, we can just click. OK. So this is now made a specimens, a samples, a sites, and a locations file. So we can say OK. And let's just go give a quick look into that folder. Um, and we can see that those were indeed uh, created. So here, before this folder just had the files that came off, came off the magnetometer, and now we have made these magic formatted. OK, and we're in that same directory where we generated those files. And now what we can do is we can click on this blue button, DMAG GUI. These are thermal demagnetization data, and this will allow us to visualize them. We should get that compiled required data. Might take a minute, and then we'll come into this, uh, this, this panel. Okay. Cool. It'd actually be kind of nice if people want to hop in the chat and tell tell us how many people have gotten to this this step, um, because it'll sort of Excellent. Wow, that's that's good. Okay, awesome. Good you, to hear it. You would add your uh, operating system uh, and version uh, that could help us with debugging, also. Yeah. So it seems like Rob, where you you were having that hold up issue as John. Did it just take you a little bit of just a little bit of time, and then it worked? Asking Rob Sternberg this question. Okay. Okay, excellent. Great. Well, it seems like a good a good number of people are are with us, which I'm happy happy to see. Um okay. Okay, great. So now what we're what we uh should see here um is the actual the actual data. So these data are behind the hood are now in mag uh in in magic format. 
um, but we're and we're reading in and visualizing them here. So what we can what we can see here is we're looking at thermal thermal demagnetization data. Um, one thing that looks a little bit wonky is we also did a low low temperature uh, liquid nitrogen dunk on these. So when we see here in the uh, demagnetization plot um, that it goes down to a lower temperature, that actually is correct. It, it did that. So here what we can see is we can see in this panel that we have a Ziderfeld plot. Um, we have the ability to look at this uh, vector component plot in a number of different coordinate systems. We could look at the tilt corrected, for example. Um, we could make the, we could change the projection such that X is north or the X is aligned with the declination of the NRM. Um, but here we're going to keep, I'm going to keep X, X equals X equals east. So here we can actually go through and it will highlight the different points as we go through. You can see it's highlighting them both on the specimen equal area plot. So this is the direction of each measurement, um, as well as down here on the intensity plot. So we have this panel of seeing these all together. Now to start with here, let's, uh, let's fit what we might consider the characteristic remnant magnetization of this, of this sample, uh, which is demagnet demagnetizing at the higher temperatures. Uh, temperatures are which are consistent with it being held by magnetite. So what I'm going to do here is go up here to this interpretation options at the top and I'm going to click add fit. Now here the default is to add a fit from the NRM all the way to the final step. Now that of course is a poor fit given that we can see that there are multiple components here. So we can adjust the bounds. There's two ways we can do that. One, we can use these drop down windows here. So let's say I want to bring it to 425. Great. We can also double click on here. So we could double click the bounds um, to change them if you find that more useful. So now the actual, the, that actual fit is now being plotted here, both in the Ziderfeld plot as well as on the specimen equal, equal area plot. So that's great. We have a fit. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and just make fits to all of these samples in the same way. We'll just click add fit, change the bounds. After we go through each specimen, I'll show a way that we can do this in bulk. But one of the reasons I want to do this here is to highlight um, something. And that is up in the upper right, when I made this fit on specimen 2A, I got a warning. Within fit one, there are multiple good measurements at the 570 step. Maybe you want this to be the case. In this case, it was because we did a remeasure. We were surprised at this angular, uh, how big the angular difference was here, um, and we wanted to do a remeasure. One thing that we can do here is we can mark that point as bad. And this is actually a column, measurement quality in, in the magic, uh, in the MAGIC database. Um, and it will actually put in a flag that this point is bad. So now you can see that point got marked red. It's actually being excluded from the fit. It's still being visualized, but it's hard to see because it's really, really far in there. So we can drag here and zoom in. We could zoom in a little bit more. I can right click and change to a drag. So you can see this one's marked bad and sort of right before the sample had fully decayed. To, to the origin. All right, so let's go through. Let's just keep making those, those fits. Um, looks like 425 20, up to the final point is a good one here. I'll point out here too that the interpretation type is being set here. Here we're making it a line. Um, if you chose, you can make it an anchored line or a line that includes the origin as a point. You can also do plane fits. In this case, Let's just keep it as a, as a least squares line to the data themselves. Here we go. We'll add another fit. Adjust the bounds. Add a fit. Adjust the bounds. So that one, maybe we want to go a little bit higher. That looks pretty good. All right, we just have three more samples to go here. 
pull that one up to 515 as well. Okay, and add fit. Okay, so now we've made fits to all, all of the specimens in, in this site. And what I'm going to do is we can now visualize these data at the site level. So over here, I'm going to come over and I want to see all the fits. So here are all the fits being, being shown in this uppermost right uh, equal area plot. And we can also tell DMAG GUI that we want to see the mean. So here we see the mean and we can see its declination, its inclination, it's alpha 95, et cetera. We can, of course, visualize this in geographic coordinates or go to specimen coordinates uh, and see how it, how it changes. But let's come back here to tilt corrected. So I just want to sh show quick that we're on, we've had autosave correct, uh, selected right now um, for, for these fits. We could also save by clicking on this right now. And what this is doing is it's not saving it to magic format yet, but it's saving a very lightweight file that's called a redo file. It's called that slightly silly name because that um, allows you to re-import fits before you've exported to uh, magic format. And so let's just give a quick look at what that data looks like. It's a simple text file that has the specimen name, the type of fit using the magic method code, in this case, directional estimate, best fit line. It has the bounds. These are given in Kelvin, because that's the underlying, uh, underlying unit in the magic database. Um, we have fit one, and then we have the color. And now these are all called good. OK, so I just want to show quickly what that looks like. Um, I'm going to come back to the PMAG GUI window. And Courtney's asked the question, should we have all selected? What this will do when we make a different fit is it, also, it would make different Fisher mean fits to the different components. We could also just say Fisher one. Um, but this brings up a good point that we have multiple components here. Um, and I sort of behooves us to also fit this uh, low temperature component. What I can see here is that in almost all of these, it looked like that fit was kind of coming off between pretty nicely between 100 and 300 degrees. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up into the PMAG GUI, uh, PMAG GUI interpretation editor. Um, so this is going up to the menu bar and going to tools. And there's a tools called interpretation editor. Um, there's a tool that Kevin Gastra built that is pretty useful. Okay, for some reason I've, I've lost seeing the chat, but that's okay. Okay, so here we now see a list of all the fits that we've made to, to the specimens. Now here I call them fit one, but that's not particularly informative um, given that there are multiple components here. So what I might wanna do is actually give them a different name. Maybe I wanna call them HT for high temperature. And maybe I don't want them to be green, but I want them to be cadet blue. So here with these all selected over here, I can say apply changes to highlighted fits. Okay. Um, and it was saying it wanted to see fit one, so I'll need to go back and say that what I want to see is fit HT. You can see I changed what level we wanted to be displaying things. Here I want to be displaying it at the site level, here I want to be seeing my HT directions, and here we could go ahead and we can see the Fisher mean in here as well. Okay, great, just checking the chat there for the question. All right, so here, what we can choose to do is instead of going through one sample at a time, let's say we want to make an LT fit, the low temperature fit. Um, we can make it a dark orange color. And we could have the bounds be from 100 to 300. 
Now what I can do is I can say, add fit to highlighted specimens, or I could also have just said, add new fit to all specimens. So now we've had, a, uh, if we look over in the fit, I've now made an HT and an LT fit for all of these. Um, and we can go ahead and see uh, both of them. So here, this sort of gets to the earlier question that was being asked. Here, all is being selected. We're seeing both the LT and the HT fits. We can see that we have a Fisher mean being calculated for all of these fits together. That's not particularly informative. But I could toggle over and see the one just for the LT component or for the HT. Here also, the LT component, we should probably be considering in geographic coordinates. Because if we do so, we can see that that actually right now, even with having even looked through these fits, is statistically indistinguishable from the present local field on this island in Lake Superior. Okay, so we we batch made all of those all of those fits. And what we can do now is we can now go look at them. So I'm going to go back to our main panel here, where we see here now on specimen uh, A that we have this low temperature fit as well. I feel pretty good about that one. We can keep it going. This one seems to have an overlapping thermal and blocking spectra, perhaps, uh, with the HT component. So I might choose to delete that fit. You could make your own choice on that, but that just illustrates deleting the fit. Perhaps this one, I want to change the upper bound to go a little bit higher. That one looks pretty good. This one, the low temperature component, doesn't look to be very well expressed. So I'll delete that one. Uh, same holds true with that one. Okay. Okay, so now we have made we have made our fits. Um, we of course could uh, think about these a little bit more, but we now have fits fits for this site. Um, we can save them to that redo file. One thing that we could do um, if we quit out of here, and if we re-import, if we bring the data up, we actually won't see our fits anymore. So I'll just highlight here, we've saved that redo file. And here I can go up to file and I can say import interpretations from a redo file. And then I could read back in these fits we've made. In this case, I wanna illustrate how we can save our magic tables. So we have our fits, we feel good about our fits and we're ready to uh, save, save them to magic tables. So we can go here to file and we can go save magic tables. It's gonna tell me that before it does this, it's gonna save a redo file, so that's nice. And then we're gonna come here and we'll get a dialogue that will ask us some questions about what we wanna do. And this is gonna be sort of appropriate for different sample sets. In this case, I think I wanna save my data in the specimen coordinates, geographic coordinates, and tilt corrected coordinates. So I'll select those and I'll say, okay. So now what it's done is it's saved the specimen interpretations that we made into the specimens.txt file. So that means it's actually written out the directions that correspond with these least square interpretations that we've made into that specimens.txt file that's now ready for magic upload. I say okay. And now we can also generate a magic results table. So in this case, the low temperature component should be considered in geographic coordinates, and the high temperature component is a um, TRM that we should consider in tilt corrected coordinates. So I'm going to save both in geographic and tilt corrected. And what I'm most interested in here is a uh, site mean. So we're going to calculate the site mean, averaging the site by specimens, making the calculation type Fisher. And I'll sort of reiterate here that each of these decisions that we're making the associated method codes are going to get written to the magic tables um, associate, associated with um, this calculation. So here I'll say, okay. And here it's done it, but let's actually go and make sure that it, that is the case. 
Um, so here we'll go into our folder. Yeah, so for example, here, here's our specimens.txt uh, our specimens.txt table, which has now been written here. And we could open that in a text editor. Um, and we can see here that it's actually written out these fits. So here for specimen one is the LT. Um, we then have its declination and its inclination. Um, it's recording these both in a tilt corrected and not tilt corrected one. Each one of those gets a separate, uh, a separate row. Um, one thing I'll just sort of point out here is you'll see um, when we uh, go to the next step, which will be creating a magic uh, contribution, that we'll be missing a little bit of data. Um, and so there sometimes is a bit of manual editing that needs to happen on some of these. For example, our lab file format has a sort of frustrating aspect where it can't record the latitude and longitude of a site to more than a, a tenth of a decimal degree precision, which is really poor precision. So we find ourselves needing to go in here and adding more detail about the site location. So that's just one, uh, one example. But this actually would be the stage where there could be you know, we've done a lot of the underlying uh, work here um, through, through the DMAG GUI, but there can be a little bit of additional metadata that it can be nice to add, add to these tables. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this DMAG GUI window is I am going to close it. And it should be bring me back to this PMAG GUI uh, main main window here. <clears throat> why don't I do a quick quick pause here just and do why don't we do another quick sort of type in the chat if you're if you're with us uh, with us thus far. Um, and if you got to where we are without errors. Okay, excellent. Getting lots of good. Good to know that there's there's people successfully following along out there. Okay, so we have each of those those magic those magic tables, um, and one of the things we could choose to do now, um, if we're all done and we've analyzed all our sites and we have all our fits, is to create a file for upload to the magic database. So here to do that, I'm going to click on this green button. And it tried to do it. And what we can see here is we got an error message. And we should get this error message. Um, and what we'll see is that there's some, there's some fields that didn't validate. And so I'm going to click OK here. And what will come up is will be a helpful dialog that will actually show us the fields that, are, that we're missing. And this is because our underlying lab format uh, doesn't have quite all the data that's necessary to provide this complete, complete picture. So for example, if we go to add location data, we'll see that we're missing a few things. We're missing age information. We're missing information about the geologic classes, lithologies, and location types. What's nice here is in this edit location window, we can actually click here and we'll get the controlled vocabulary. So for in this case, this is an extrusive lava flow. Um, it's a basalt. So we could choose extrusive. I could even choose another class, let's say igneous. We'll see here, this is a list. So we can choose a number of different classes. They'll be separated by colons. In terms of lithology, I can go down and I can communicate that this is indeed a basaltic lava. And there also is no information about the location type. In this case, this was a, this was a section, section on land, um, so we could call it a land section. So what I can do now is I can save and close grid. And this will add those data. We can do the same thing for the site data. We can go ahead, see the geologic classes, put in what we need to do there. 
and also put in the right geologic types, which in this case is a lava, and go ahead and put in this information about, I guess we called it a, a basaltic lava. Now I have both. Um, and then the age unit is going to be in millions of years. Okay. Um, so we're still actually uh, missing missing in this file the the age the age information, um, and so that's something that we could go go in and add as as well. Um, but I want to just for the moment sort of point out what we what we have. Um, and that is that we took these underlying files and really what that command, that last command we just did was took all these individual magic files, um, which are these, um, and it combined them together into this single text file that could be uploaded to, um, to the magic, to the magic database. Um, what I want to make sure which I think we can see all the way through, um, but what I want to do right now, just to make sure we have um, we have we have time, um, this is the sort of if you were following around with Nick's demo yesterday, this is the file that you could grab and then drag and drop onto the website onto the website interface. Um, but what I want to show right now is is to actually unpack the magic contribution that was associated with the study from which this site is, is from. Um, so that would have been also part of this zip folder that you downloaded. It's in this Fairchild 2017. And you can see here is the magic contribution. And this was its contribution number um, right, right here. Um, so here, what we should do back in this main panel is to go ahead and change your directory. And let's change it to be that Fairchild 20, 2017 folder. In that folder at this point, there should be nothing other than the magic contribution itself. Again, this is the text file you would get if you went up onto magic and you just said, give, give me the data, um, you could down, download this .txt file. Okay, so we should be now into that, uh, into that directory. And now what we can do is we can click on one of these orange buttons again, which is the download or unpack magic text file button. Now there's two options here. Uh, Lori recently coded up a way where you can download directly from magic entering the contribution ID or DOI, which is pretty cool. Um, in this case, we've downloaded it here. Um, so I'm just gonna say unpack previous downloaded file. We'll navigate to this magic contribution, which itself was pulled down from magic. And we can say open. Okay, great, it says success. So what does success mean? Success means that it took that magic contribution and it unpacked it into the measurements file, the samples file, the sites file, the specimens file. Um, and so here we have the data from the study at the measurement level. So now what we can do is we can go to analysis and plots and we can click on DMEG GUI. Here there's gonna be more data, so we're gonna to have to be a little bit more patient while we have this compile, compiling required data. Please wait. Okay, and here we are now uh, looking at the data um, associated with, uh, with the study, um, and we're seeing the fits that were made with, with the study. So for example, we could go look at, here are all the specimens in this study, and we could go look at, say, SS20, which we are looking looking at looking at before. Um, so here, um, what's really nice about this is, you know, in our paper, we report uh, a mean 
um, calculated for this site and for these fits. And so what you can see now are the decisions that we made that went into that overall mean. Here's the site mean um, as we published, as exported from DMED GUI. And here we can see the measurement level data and can see the fit that's here. So this would give the opportunity to us or to anyone else um, to go in and think about these, these data in a, in a different, different way, perhaps. Um, you could see that we made the decision to actually not, uh, not put in the low, low temperature fits. What we really wanted to know um, was the char characteristic uh, remnant, remnant magnetization associated with when this lava erupted uh, 1,084 million years ago. Um, so, but here we could go in and we could sort of choose, choose differences in terms of, in terms of the bounds. Um, at this point, I sort of wouldn't, you know, we've, we've published it this way, we've, we've used it this way, but you could save out a new set of magic tables that you could upload to the magic database, um, if you, if you so, if you so chose. Um, and here we can look through our other sites as well. I guess here we did make the low temperature fits. Um, great. So yeah, so in this way we've now seen how in, a, in addition to, uh, into, to uploading or sort of converting data from, uh, we can use DMEGUI as this tool to convert our data and it's also a very handy way to visualize data that are within the uh, the magic database, and they're there at the at the measurement level. This provides a way to um, to, to visualize them. Um, so that that is what I wanted to get through in terms of live live demo um, uh, material. Um, but I'd be very happy to uh, answer answer additional questions um, that that people have. You could sort of. Um, unmute yourself, show, you, show yourself if you want, um, uh, so that we could, if people have any questions that are specific to their lab or that sort of came up in the course of this demo. Hey, Nick. Thanks yeah. for walking us through. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on what's actually being saved out of the program when you do great circle fits. Um, Cause I've been doing these recently and I don't actually know what it's recording um, in, in the output tables. Okay, that's a good question. So in the, in the, in the redo file, it's just recording the bounds and the type of the fit. Mm -hmm. um, and well, I don't know. Let's let's do it and look, because <laughs> um, I haven't I haven't dealt with. All right, so here if we did a plain fit, so here we're gonna make our ht be a plane. I guess we would pull our bounds to be lower. Um, I mean, have you sort of done a visual inspection of it? And you're you're basically saying in the specimens table what's being recorded. Yeah, yeah. So I've done some fits that I'm comfortable with, but then it records out. Um, there's dirt deck, dirt ink, but then there's also like best fit vector that's being output. Okay. So what I think it is, um, but let's let's have a look. What I think it is is probably recording the pole to the plane. Yeah, that's what I thought, but um, <laughs> I wanted to be sure. Um, but let's, I mean, we can have a look. We can see what we think the poll is. In terms of the best dir that's using, and I'm forgetting the citation of the method, but we could have, we could have a look here. Um, well, I think we can actually look at it here. So if I change this to a plain fit, um, someone should type in what the, um, yeah, so I think we're saving the normal to the plane. Um, what we can visualize here is we can visualize the whole fit plus the best fit vector, right? And the best fit vector is gonna be the location on that plane that is closest to the intersection with the other planes. Right. Um, and we're using the, the method that I should be remembering the citation for. But so let's change this one to a plane as well. 
Um, oh, okay, yeah, and John's actually just looked. We can see that this interpretation that we're looking at right now um, is indeed the normal to the plane. Okay. Um, and so here, let's see if we looked at HT. Yeah, so here we can see, well, I have some lines, right? So right now, the if we do have some line fits, those are also being used to determine the best fit vector on those planes, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I think what's being saved out is the pole to the plane and then the best fit vector um, sort of associated with the full interpretation of both line fits yeah. as well as the intersection of the vectors. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yep, and you can see the uh, yeah the endpoints look different. I forgot about that feature. They're nice. They're little little triangles. Um, but yeah, so Courtney, does that write out? It writes additional columns with that best fit vector direction. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So those are output as well on top of like dir deck and dir ink. Okay. Great. But only yeah, and it's only recording them for the ones that are fit by um, planes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Perfect. So yeah, I th I th I think that machinery should be. Uh, yeah, should be should be working well, but um, okay. but uh, let yeah let us know if you bump into issues issues with it. Deal. Other other question other questions out there. Um, I will sort of highlight as well that this same sort of process that we went through in terms of uh, data data conversion and visualization can work for paleo intensity experiments um, and as a way to go to the Tellier GUI tool and subsequently save, uh, save, save out data. Um, of course, there can be hurdles of individual lab, lab formats as well. Um, but if, you, if you're intrigued by these tools and are using a lab format that either isn't in there um, or is um, where it's having some issues, not all of these are as well tested. Um, certainly, uh, certainly, certainly raise raise issues in GitHub is the, is a great way to be you know, to be be in touch. Um, but we sort of hope we you know realize there are lots of different tools that are that are out there that are sort of accomplish this type of data analysis. Um, but you know one of the main reasons why we've sort of been working on building uh, this set of tools in in, in particular uh, is that it provides this this sort of ready connection with the with the magic database. Just a quick question. Um, if we were interested in trying to get our lab format into kind of the, the PMAG GUI um, like conversion process, who would be the person to contact to try to get code written so that we can get it Nicely. Yeah, I mean, it was something we were gonna at the Magic Workshop run some consultation sessions. I mean, I would, I'd raise an, I'd raise an issue as the first place. Um, okay. Lisa, you know, Lori and I will, uh, will, will see it. Um, and the nice thing about a GitHub issue, um, which I guess I could sort of just navigate to what those, what those look <laughs> like since we're talking about it, um, is it just provides a sort of place of record where there could be discussion about it. Um, so here, if I went and went to issues um, and raised, raised a new issue. So you can see that we have both um, bug report and feature request. Um, so in this case, it'd be sort of on the feature request side. Okay. Um, and then we have a number of sort of ways to sort of start, start the, cover, the conversation um, okay. there. And you can submit, submit an issue. Um, I guess you need a GitHub account to do it, but yeah. Um, cool. Thanks. Oh yeah, John's asking what what's what's WMF, John? Oh, Windows Windows meta meta file. Okay, so that's a that's a that's a uh, data data format. Oh, are you saying as a export? export options um, I, yeah what, what options do we actually have right now I see um, I would yeah I the I mean I guess I guess that's that's possible um, are you not able to is there PDFs and SVGs aren't 
don't do the trick, huh? Um, yeah, I'm sure any, anything's possible. Uh, that is one thing I guess I'll point out since we have like four, four more minutes here is you can be saving, um, uh, yeah, is that you can go, we can go ahead and save, save plots as well. Um, so I could here, if I wanted this to be an example plot, um, I could save out a Zytopel plot or I could save out all plots. Um, we could save them into this folder and we can choose what we want uh, with the current options being a raster PNG or vector files, SVG and PDF right now. Um, and we can, this is gonna save out all of those plots and then we can go look at them. Um, and so here's the save, saved out. Seiderfeld plot. Nearly, nearly publication ready, uh, though you can see there's some issues with, uh, with the labels on it, so it might take a little bit of tweaking. Um, okay. All right, excellent. Well, I'm happy to, um, uh, yeah, if people have uh, future, future questions, um, don't, don't hesitate to be, um, yeah, to be to be in touch, um, and I yeah appreciate you all all joining me. Best best wishes in these uh, tumult tumultuous times, and I look forward to seeing many of you in person before all all too long. Also, for the few of you still here, Lisa should be great tomorrow. Why? Right. See you, everyone. <laughs>